Hello once again, friends. This will be a talk on anemia of chronic disease. Now, I give this its own special talk because anemia of chronic disease is something that can manifest either as a microcytic anemia with an MCV below 80 or as a normocytic anemia. And typically, we see this in the 80s. And so it is often a normocytic anemia, but very low, very low MCV compared to the other normocytic anemias like things like bone marrow failure or, uh, or blood loss or hemolysis. So you may see it categorized as one or the other. So I figure I should give it its own talk. And I want to give it its own talk too because there's some pathologic features here that can be tested on boards. So I'm going to keep this talk pretty short, but I want to sort of use this as a bridge between the microcytic anemias and the normocytic anemias. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link below in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. You can consider chipping in a dollar a month. A little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. I really just rely on voluntary contributions. I've been putting up these free videos for several years. I don't believe in charging people for medical review, so uh, that's sort of my philosophy. But like I said, I appreciate all the uh, all the voluntary contributions I can get. Uh, otherwise, feel free to subscribe to my channel or patronize my advertisers by clicking on the ads and seeing what they have to say. All of that is very much appreciated. So with anemia of chronic disease, obviously these patients are going to have anemic symptoms. Now in clinical practice, this is pretty difficult to tease out. And the reason is because fatigue, weakness, malaise, and pallor you know, people who have chronic disease just in general feel like crap. And so it's going to be really hard to know, are they anemic? Uh, or are they, do they just have these symptoms because of their disease? So this is why we frequently do labs on patients who require treatment, ongoing treatment for, uh, for chronic disease. And Another reason we do it too is because if they're on immunosuppressants, we want to make sure that we're not immunosuppressing them too much. But so one of the ways that this will be given to you on the exam when you've got a patient with anemia of chronic diseases, they'll tell you, okay, they've got Crohn's disease or they've got some sort of autoimmune disease and now their CBC is showing a hemoglobin of eight and what's going on. And so this is going to be in conjunction, as mentioned, with a low or a normal MCV. And it's just going to be a simple anemia. Maybe they'll tell you they've got symptoms, maybe not. So basically, your picture here is a patient with anemic symptoms that has some kind of underlying autoimmune disorder, whether that's the presenting feature or not. How does this come about? Well, there are three real key events that are happening, and they're all related, and they all relate to chronic inflammation. So first of all, they have increased levels of hepcidin, and hepcidin comes from chronic inflammation. And what hepcidin does is it blocks a protein called ferroportin. And ferroportin is, just like its name implies, the door for iron to get from where it's stored, your intestinal cells or macrophages or the liver, into the peripheral circulation. Remember that we don't absorb iron in our GI tract as we need it. We absorb iron in our GI tract and then we store it in cells for a rainy day. And when your iron goes down, then you can bring iron from those cells into the circulation. Hepcidin gets in the way of that. And so when you begin to need iron, you can't get it from the cells you're storing it in. And so that is one way that you get an anemia here. And you can see from that, that's one way that it can indeed cause a microcytic anemia because you're essentially sequestering iron away from your circulation and ultimately from your red blood cells. Another way that this happens is by increased levels of apoferritin. Apoferritin being the precursor protein for ferritin. Remember what ferritin does. Ferritin holds iron inside your cells. So by holding iron inside your cells, it prevents the release of iron to go out of your cells if you hold more iron in your cells. So like hepcidin, apoferritin is an acute phase reactant. So both of these are going to go up in the context of inflammation. Now, why are these acute phase reactants? 
They happen with inflammation. Why do you want to do that? Well, your body is adapted to go into an inflammatory response when it's infected. And it just so happens that bacteria and other microbes feast on iron. So your body's developed this way that if you have inflammation, you're going to you're going to hoard that iron away from microbes and ultimately the microbes will die. And that's how your body has adapted to fighting off microbes. However, inflammation is not only caused by infection, it's also caused by autoimmune disorders. So if you have chronic inflammation from an autoimmune disorder, you get this exact same response. And then finally, decreased erythropoiesis. This is a complex inflammatory response and it's due to different mediators that suppress erythropoietin uh, or erythropoiesis. And you can see here this would be the driving factor for a normocytic anemia that you're making red blood cells but you're not making enough. The overall result is a normocytic or slightly microcytic anemia with no total deficiency of iron. You have no problem absorbing iron through your GI tract. You've got the iron there your body's just preventing you from using it. The overall goal, like I said, is to keep iron out of the circulation to prevent pathogens from metabolizing it. This is the, uh, this is sort of a nice illustration of how this is working. Notice that hepcidin is the prima donna of the show, and there are different things that increase hepcidin, things like that you should recognize like IL-6, and lipopro lipopolysaccharide, both of these either result from inflammation or in the case of lipopolysaccharide comes from uh, gram-negative bacteria and these some of these other things that you don't need to worry about. So hepcidin blocks ferroportin, ferroportin keeps iron out of the circulation. So when you compare this to microcytic anemia, let's say that you get your CBC and you see that this is a microcytic anemia, it should be fairly obvious what you're not dealing with. Because the MCV is going to be low normal, you know you're not dealing with thalassemia or sideroblastic anemia, which should be quite low. And you're probably not dealing with iron deficiency, which, which would also be quite low. All these other three causes are, are always going to be a microcytic anemia, and, and quite low, in, in fact. Uh, but usually the thing that you're going to be trying to distinguish this from is from iron deficiency anemia. And the reason for that is because a lot of patients who have chronic inflammation can also be malnourished. So this is why then you get your iron studies and it'll be pretty obvious uh, when you get your iron studies what you're dealing with and what you're looking at is the transferrin and the ferritin. Transferrin are surrogate markers TIBC. So uh, with your transferrin remember that's the protein that transfers iron in the peripheral circulation. With iron deficiency, that is high, and that's high because we want to maximize the amount of proteins that we can have to carry iron, uh, and, and thus maximize the amount of iron in the circulation. With TIBC, or sorry, with anemia of chronic disease, TIBC is going to be low because you want to do the exact opposite. You want less iron in your circulation. Ferritin, remember, is an acute phase reactant. So that's going to be high in anemia of chronic disease. And remember, ferritin is how we store iron. And so you want to store your iron when you want to sequester it. With iron deficiency anemia, it's going to be low. You don't have enough iron. And so you're not going to be storing much iron. You want all that iron to be out in the circulation because you just don't have enough of it. You want to be getting that iron out to developing red blood cells. So in the case of iron deficiency, that's going to be low. And like I said, you can go back and watch my video on microcytic anemia. I talk about this in greater detail there. So how do you distinguish anemia of chronic disease from other causes of microcytic or normocytic anemia? Well, first you want to start by looking, is this microcytic or is this normocytic? And usually it's going to be pretty close, one or the other. Uh, but if it's microcytic, let's say you're 77, remember your mnemonic TAILS, T-A-I-L-S, thalassemia, anemia of chronic disease, iron deficiency anemia, and lead poisoning and sideroblastic anemia. Thalassemia on test questions, they'll give you a family history. Usually they'll tell you this patient is black or Asian or Mediterranean, and they'll probably tell you that there's target cells on the smear. So in that case, you get an electrophoresis to confirm thalassemia. Iron deficiency anemia, we already talked about how to differentiate the two. They'll probably tell you in the vignette that this is a younger woman with heavy periods, or this is an older person who's been, you know, who's got a history of, uh, of something consistent with peptic ulcer disease or 
Uh, they haven't had a colonoscopy in a long time, and in that case, you've got to get a stool guaiac test and then endoscopy. Uh, lead poisoning, sideroblastic anemia, uncommon. Uh, you may give you a patient, a, a child who is gnawing on, on uh, paint or uh, low socioeconomic status, or they may give you a patient who's recently had treatment for, for uh, tuberculosis and so forth. Again, you can go back and watch that video if you haven't yet. Normocytic anemia, the most important thing to do with that is to check your reticulocyte count. And a reticulocyte count is just a measure of how many blood cells, how many red blood cells in the circulation are immature. And that's all reticulocytes are. And it should be between half percent to two percent. So because anemia of chronic disease, as we mentioned, involves a reduced ability to synthesize red blood cells, because of those suppressing cytokines, the reticulocytes will be low. Now, what else gives us a normocytic anemia with a low reticulocyte count? Aplastic anemia, which is a totally different process. Now, with aplastic anemia, that's bone marrow failure. And so with bone marrow failure, you would expect to see low cell counts on all cell lines. So you would expect to see low white blood cell count, low platelets, and low red blood cells. Not the case with anemia of chronic disease. It's just going to be low red blood cells. Uh, and so this will result in pancytopenia and or it could result in a high erythropoietin. But look for uh, the difference with aplastic anemia is going to be uh, that you'll see a pancytopenia. And then if the reticulocytes are normal or high, then your differential should include the other causes of normocytic anemia, which are primarily blood loss or hemolytic anemia. And so to differentiate the two of those, you would look for signs and labs consistent with hemolysis. Okay. The diagnosis of anemia of chronic disease is based on your clinical findings in conjunction with the patient's history typically of having some kind of chronic inflammatory state. Uh, the reticulocytes, like I said, will be low due to the inflammatory mediators. Elevated reticulocytes are not consistent with anemia of chronic disease, so those reticulocytes should be low. If there are other cytopenias, then that suggests an aplastic anemia, in which case you should get a bone marrow biopsy. The focus of therapy is going to be to treat the underlying cause. If you treat the underlying inflammation, those inflammatory mediators should go away, and you should be able to start incorporating iron into hemoglobin and start making your red blood cells as normal. So think of things like steroids or immunosuppressants or disease modulators. All of those things will help treat the underlying cause. Now do remember that when your body then starts going into overdrive and making a lot of red blood cells, you need to have the products there for them. So B12 and folate are going to be really important to that end because you need B12 and you need folate for nucleotide synthesis. So making sure they have supplemental B12 and folate are good because if you don't, they're going to go into a macrocytic anemia and that can be a problem. Uh, transfusions for anemia of chronic disease are rarely necessary. One thing I want to point out now that we're at the end here is that there are some chronic diseases that affect the kidney. And remember that the kidney is responsible for making erythropoietin. So if you've got a patient who's got a, a, a normocytic anemia and they've got chronic kidney disease, you may think, okay, they've got anemia of chronic disease, and in fact they do. But keep in mind that one of the major factors that's driving their anemia is a deficiency in erythropoietin. And if, a lot of times for these patients, if you add on erythropoietin, you're really going to help them out. So patients with underlying chronic kidney disease that are anemic would benefit from getting erythropoietin analogs like epoietin and darbipoietin. And that is it for anemia of chronic disease.